Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And one of the things that surprised me, uh, that's a very broad mission. It's a lot of work. We're not going to achieve it anytime soon, right? Uh, it's almost an impossible task. But it's an exciting task and one that you can get other people excited about and they can help you. And one of the things that also surprised me is it's sometimes easier to do something that's harder because other people get excited about it and you can get much more resource. Uh, you can get tremendous resources to solve a hard problem, whereas you might only get minor resources to solve a small problem. Um, right now, Google's available in over 100 languages. And I'll just give you another tidbit about um, uh, sort of where you can get leverage. Uh, we had some engineers work really hard. They're trying to build artificial intelligence. Uh, they're trying to make computers smart. And they accidentally built a really good spell checker along the way. Uh, using the technology they wanted to use to build artificial intelligence. And it's on Google now, and if you misspell something, which I do continuously, I can't spell it all, um, it helps a lot to be able to find things to spell it correctly. So it's a very important issue with quality of search. The spell checker that they wrote, uh, with a much bigger goal in mind, actually understands all different languages. Uh, it understands languages that the people who implemented it don't speak. Uh, because it basically uses all the information on the web and it does clever things. Um, and that's really, really cool. I mean, it's really interesting to build stuff like that. Similar to speech, we are seeing great improvements in computer vision. So when we look at a picture like this, we are able to understand the attributes behind the picture. We realize it's your boy in a birthday party. There was cake and family involved and your boy was happy. So we can understand all that better now. And our computer vision systems now for the task of image recognition are even better than humans. So it's astounding progress and we're using it across our products. So if you use the Google Pixel, it has the best in class camera and we do a, do a lot of work with computer vision. You can take a low light picture like this, which is noisy and we automatically make it much clearer for you. Or, or, coming, or coming very soon, if you take a picture of your daughter at a baseball game and there is something obstructing it, we can do the hard work, remove the obstruction, <laughs> and have the picture of what matters to you in front of you. We are clearly at an inflection point with vision and so today, we are announcing a new initiative called Google Lens. Google Lens is a set of vision-based computing capabilities that can understand what you're looking at and help you take action based on that information. We'll ship it first in Google Assistant and Photos, and it'll come to other products. So how does it work? So for example, if you run into something and you want to know what it is, say a flower, you can invoke Google Lens from your assistant, point your phone at it, and we can tell you what flower it is. It's great for someone like me with allergies. <laughs> or if you've ever been at a friend's place and you've crawled under a desk just to get the username and password from a Wi-Fi router, you can point your phone at it. <laughs> and we can automatically do the hard work for you. Or if you're walking in a street downtown and you see a set of restaurants across you, you can point your phone because we know where you are and we have our knowledge graph and we know what you're looking at, we can give you the right information in a meaningful way. So I'll start off, uh, speaking of 10X, I'll just start off with a little 10X experience myself. Um, I was 10 years when I first saw this movie uh, and then I probably saw it easily 10 more times. And then I uh, watch songs from this movie easily 100 more times. I'm Telugu and I'm talking about the movie Sagara Sangamam, uh, where, <laughs> and, uh, where the song was uh, Takita Tadimi. Um, and this morning, you know, before this, I played it 10 more times. I just wanted to let uh, folks know that. Um, uh, with that, I want to actually start off, <coughs> given this audience, uh, we are all about building products, building products that millions of users love, which if you look at it, that's what you've done. You've done it over many years, over many movies, many times. So I want to kind of get your sense of 
I want to pick your brain on the creative process, right? When you think of a movie like Nayagan or Guna or Hiram, where do you get that initial spark of inspiration? I, I get terribly scared. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I jump into fork and knife. <laughs> when appetite is good, then you jump straight to the act. Um, I get terribly concerned when people ask me, how do you do market research? <laughs> no, I, I don't. Yeah. Th th that's the thing. There's something much deeper and bigger than uh, it, 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 it's, it's your mind, what you love most. Because if you truly believe that you're part of a crowd, then your assumption, your need, your, uh, your passion will be emulated by the crowd. Because you are one of them. You, you've learned your, your accent, your, your weaknesses, your anger, your food taste. It's all from one place. So it's, it's confusing for me to go compute. If I had done that, I would have been in school. I'm a dropout. <laughs> I, I couldn't uh, go that route. But instead of going on an outward travel, I always travel inward. It's a bigger space. Everybody's space is bigger than what they can mm -hmm. possibly traverse with available transport. When you travel inside, it's, it's fantastic distances you can cover. And you don't even have to be there, but you'd have been there before Neil Armstrong. That's what Jules Verne did. Mm -hmm. In his mind. Yeah. He's, he specifically described what almost 80% right, the way the rocket launch took place and how the capsule fell back into the sea. So he's done the travel much, much before America even thought of it. The government, yep. I mean. So that's what I meant, that I, when you make a product, you go with that feeling. Yeah. People call it gut, people, some say mind, some say manas. There's yeah. this constant uh, trouble when they say manas in, in, in our language. They touch here. That's not where it is. It's here. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, uh, there's this uh, confusion, location, address <laughs> confusion. <laughs> Wrong Which uh, I, I, I live between the two years. It seems like a narrow place to live in, but it's a, it's a lot of Lebensraum, as Hitler would like to call it, living space. Mobile made us reimagine every product we were working on. We had to take into account that the user interaction model had fundamentally changed with multi-touch, location, identity, payments, and so on. Similarly, in an AI-first world, we are rethinking all our products and applying machine learning and AI to solve user problems. And we are doing this across every one of our products. So today, if you use Google Search, we rank differently using machine learning. Or if you're using Google Maps, Street View automatically recognizes restaurant signs, street signs, using machine learning. Duo with video calling uses machine learning for low bandwidth situations and smart reply in Allo last year had great reception. And so today, we are excited that we are rolling out smart reply to over 1 billion users of Gmail. It works really well. Here's a sample email. If you get an email like this, the machine learning systems learn to be conversational, and it can reply, I'm fine with Saturday or whatever. So it's really nice to see. Just like with every platform shift, how users interact with computing changes. Mobile brought multi-touch. We evolved beyond keyboard and mouse. Similarly, we now have voice and vision as new, two new important modalities for computing. Humans are interacting with computing in more natural and immersive ways. Let's start with voice. We've been using voice as an input across many of our products. That's because computers are getting much better at understanding speech. We have had significant breakthroughs, but the pace, and even since last year, has been pretty amazing to see. Our word error rate 
continues to improve even in very noisy environments. This is why if you speak to Google on your phone or Google Home, we can pick up your voice accurately even in noisy environments. When we were shipping Google Home, we had originally planned to include eight microphones so that we could accurately locate the source of where the, where the user was speaking from. But thanks to deep learning, we use a technique called neural beam forming, we were able to ship it with just two microphones and achieve the same quality. What 20% time is is really, um, we say to our engineers in particular, um, you can decide to work on any, anything you think is really cool um, outside of what your kind of day-to-day -day job is. Um, that you know you just think is a great idea and you can gather some support from other people and maybe you can just go off and work on it together. Um, and we see a lot of that happening. I mean, most engineers are involved and most people at Google are involved in some kind of 20% project. Um, an example would be, um, you know, we have a, an intranet, on one of our intranet sites, we have a place where you can post an idea you have. So people will say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if, and they kind of talk about what their idea is. And then other people kind of say, you know, thumbs up kind of thing and say, you know, I think it's a phenomenal idea and I'm an engineer in this part of the company and I have these skills. I'd love to work with you on building that out if you're interested. Um, so a, a, a real example that, you know, I, I know a couple, of, a couple of engineers involved in this project is our Google Sky. Um, so these guys were sitting around, there were a bunch of engineers doing a bunch of different things at Google, and a couple, and, but they all have a real passion for astronomy. Um, so they started talking and they said, wouldn't it be cool if we kind of turn those Google Earth cameras kind of up to the sky? Um, and so they worked on this project uh, together on 20% time. Uh, so on their own, when they just had time on one, you know, kind of one day a week on, on kind of an average, they would just dive in and do stuff. Um, and then we came out with this phenomenal product where you hold up your phone to the sky um, and it tells you what you're looking at, exactly what stars you're looking at. And you, as you move the phone, it scans the horizon and tells you all the different stars you're looking at, what they are and how they're all linked. Um, so just something really cool. Um, that's just an example of a bunch of guys and you know, a bunch of women do. I mean, engineers just sitting around saying, wouldn't it be great to do this? Other examples are, that, are more, that are more well known, Gmail, um, which just a bunch of engineers who said, you know, a bunch of Googlers who said, I think we could do but mail better than what we're seeing out there on, on the internet uh, right now. So why don't we all get together and try it? Um, you know, at the time we were really in search, these guys came along and said, what if we did kind of, you know, a better, a better, Gmail, a better mail system, email system. And so they built it and now it's obviously one of the biggest things that, uh, that Google's known for. So I think there's a lot of that innovation that happens and, you know, you just see it going on all the time in the company. And we all are pretty confident that those are where the next big ideas are going to come from. It's not a group sitting around mandating that this is where we need to be in this space. It really is about people thinking, wouldn't it be cool if, and then that just emerges into something really, really neat. So. At Google, we are bringing our AI efforts together under Google.ai. It's a collection of efforts and teams across the company focused on bringing the benefits of AI to everyone. Google.ai will focus on three areas, state-of-the-art research, tools and infrastructure like TensorFlow and Cloud TPUs, and applied AI. So let me talk a little bit about these areas. Talking about research, we are excited about designing better machine learning models, but today it is really time consuming. It's a painstaking effort of a few engineers and scientists, mainly machine learning PhDs. We want it to be possible for hundreds of thousands of developers to use machine learning. So what better way to do this than getting neural nets to design better neural nets? We call this approach AutoML. It's learning to learn. So the way it works is we take a set of candidate neural nets, think of these as little baby neural nets, and we actually use a neural net to iterate through them till we arrive at the best neural net. We use a reinforcement learning approach. And it's, the, the results are promising. To do this is computationally hard, but cloud TPUs put it in the realm of possibility. We are already approaching state of the art in standard tasks like CIFAR image recognition. So whenever I spend time with the team and think about neural nets building their own neural nets, it reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Inception. And I tell them, we must go deeper. I wanted to share with you uh, that when I started Google, um, you know, with Sergey, as was mentioned, you know, it seems sort of obvious now that we should have done it. But at the time, we were really scared. And we were actually, you know, we were grad students, like many, many of you students. And 
you know, we, we were enjoying getting our PhDs, and, and we haven't quite finished yet as a result. And uh, although Stanford recently gave us a reinstatement form uh, when we gave a speech there. Um, but at the time, we were really scared, like, oh, we're not going to get our degrees. You know, we're going to start this company. It'll be kind of lame. And, you know, our parents were all upset. And, you know, there are all sorts of issues. And so um, one of the things that I'd been through as a student uh, was some leadership training. And one of the things they taught us was to have, uh, to not be afraid of failure. And, and instead, to have the goal to fail a lot quickly. And then eventually, you'll succeed. And I sort of took this to heart, and they also had a slogan called Healthy Disregard for the Impossible. And they actually made you write down sort of the things you would do that were kind of impossible, but you thought you might really accomplish. And that's really stuck with me in, in uh, everything that I've tried to do. And I think, you know, it was very, very close that we wouldn't have started the company. And I think there are many of you out there in sort of similar situations. You know, do you want to take a little bit more risk? Uh, do you want to try something out? And you know, even if you don't succeed, we we actually tried many things that didn't work. Um, you know, Google happened to work pretty well, uh, but there are many things that we did that didn't. But we don't worry about those, right? Because we we tried many things. So I just encourage you to take a little more risk uh, in life, and I think uh, if you do it often enough, it will really pay off. Uh, it's been a very busy year since last year. No different from my 13 years at Google. That's because we've been focused ever more on our core mission of organizing the world's information, and we are doing it for everyone, and we approach it by applying deep computer science and technical insights to solve problems at scale. That approach has served us very, very well. This is what has allowed us to scale up seven of our most important products and platforms to over a billion monthly active users each. And it's not, the, not just the scale at which these products are working. Users engage with them very heavily. YouTube not just has over a billion users, but every single day, users watch over one billion hours of videos on YouTube. Google Maps, every single day, users navigate over one billion kilometers with Google Maps. So the scale is inspiring to see and there are other products approaching the scale. We launched Google Drive five years ago, and today it is over 800 million monthly active users. And every single week, there are over 3 billion objects uploaded to Google Drive. Two years ago, at Google I.O., we launched Photos as a way to organize users' photos using machine learning. And today, we are over 500 million active users and every single day, users upload 1.2 billion photos to Google. So the scale of these products are amazing, but they're all still working up their way towards Android, which I'm excited as of this week, we crossed over 2 billion active devices of Android. <laughs>